topic that's a bit heavy on my heart, and in fact, I've spoken on it recently and was kind of debating around, do I do it again, um, just in case you think I just rehashed an old sermon, um, but it's not the case. And I've titled it, Look at Who's Doubting Now. Now, I want to ask you a question. I, I get to see the crime stats, and do you know that, that at the moment, one of the highest increases in crime is in the theft of motor vehicles? So I wanted to ask, have you locked your car? How sure are you that you locked your car tonight? Okay. Are you, are you certain? Are you, did you not just do out of autopilot? Not, yeah? This is actually a wrong illustration to start a sermon with because now you're going to be thinking about your car the whole time. I, I want to rest assured that we doubt, and often a lot of what we doubt about is either something we have absolutely no control over or it's something that we've done already. I, I don't know about you, but I often at night have got a habit of making sure all the doors are locked. Yeah? And then doing it again. And then just to be sure, to be sure, to be sure. Do it the Irish way. Uh, do it once more. Um, and this doubt sometimes slips in. Did you really? And then your whole mind just starts spinning from there, lying awake at night. Let me just go check those doors again. Have you experienced that? Well, the average person will go through doubt. In fact, some of the writers say that if, you, if you're not a, a person that's in doubt at the moment, you're going to be a person that is going to be in an area of doubt. Or you're a third type of person, and that is a person that doesn't think at all. So either you're a person that's struggling with doubt, going to struggle with doubt, or you just don't, simply don't think, which I know none of the, no one here is of that case. But what happens is we sometimes go through a place where we have spiritual doubts even. What if God really isn't there? What if God didn't call me to this? What if this wasn't the place? What if this wasn't the plan that God had? What if it's not about salvation through grace? What if I'm supposed to be doing something about it? I don't know if you've gone through moments like that. I know I have. We, we call them moments of crisis of faith almost. Going, what's happening? Now I want to assure you that anyone in their spiritual faith that says they haven't had doubt probably hasn't really thought about their spiritual faith in this. We all, including pastors, including popes, including all sorts, will go through moments of doubt in our faith. In fact, we see one of the Bible heroes, and that's John the Baptist, goes through a time of doubt here. And uh, we're going to read from Luke chapter 7, if you can turn there. Now, I want to kind of deal with what's going on here. Um, but at first, I want to give you a quote. Oswald Chambers, one of my favorite authors I love to hate sometimes. Uh, incredible author that really God has used and through his devotionals and has challenged me over years, over years, over years. That's why I love to hate him, because he really speaks the truth and, and gets it down. Well, Oswald Chambers says this, Doubt is not always a sign, that, uh, a sign that a man is wrong. It might be a sign that he is thinking. Say it again. Doubt is not always a sign that a man is wrong. It may be a sign that he is thinking. Well, what's happening here? We have John the Baptist is in prison at this moment in this text. Jesus is getting into a place of, of moving away from popularity to a, a season of persecution in his ministry that's taking place. John the Baptist is getting disciples coming to visit him, his disciples. And um, what would be custom of those in prison would be responsibility of family and friends to take care of those in prison. You didn't get your slut chips made by Pastor Paul in prison. You got simply what your family brought you, and that would come through. And so his disciples would inform him of what was going on, particularly in Jesus' ministry. So John the Baptist is in prison. Why is he in prison? Well, King Herod has, does not like the word, the things that the truth that John the Baptist is speaking and so John the Baptist is being tortured here. Now, I find this incredibly interesting, is that John the Baptist 
the prophet who's prophesied about prepares the way for his cousin. Ever thought about that? I'd wonder what the conversation between Mary and Elizabeth would have been. You know, as you compare kids, what kind of conversations would happen? Elizabeth could be just going, you know, I'm really, really struggling with John. I can't get him to eat anything. And every time he comes in from outside, he says he's eaten already. I don't know what he's doing. In fact, speaking of outside, I can't get the guy in. Side. You know, he just wants to spend all his time. And Mary's like, sure, you know, it's, it's really rough. I'm worried about my son because every time I ask, ask him a question, he answers with a story. And sometimes I've got no, no clue what that story means, so I just nod and smile. And I go on. Mary's like, but this outside thing's a problem. I can't get him inside to bath. So I've got him trying to swim, and his swimming lessons are getting there. Mary's like, oh, no, Jesus has got the swimming lessons down to a T. It's almost like took to it so easy, like he's walking. <laughs> and Mary's like, I am so concerned about Jesus' math skills. You know, he's, he's, he's struggling a little bit at school. One, he's often teaching the teachers. Two, when I, I gave him a, a word sum, so you have two fishes and three loaves, how many items do you have in your basket? Over 5,000, he said. Imagine how the struggles would have been in family and the comparisons that are going on. But John the Baptist knew his purpose. He knew what God had called him to. And he was a faithful prophet. He was to prepare the way for Jesus. He was as a king would be, as the king would be coming, so a person would go forward and shout, the king's on his way. He would get the people ready. And this is what John the Baptist did. And he preached the message. He preached a message of repentance. Repent for the kingdom is near. Judgment is near. Repent and be baptized. And he had his following, including his strange eating habits. He's a man who didn't step off what God had called him, step away from what God had called him to do. He stuck to it. And the fact he's in prison about this. And so what do we find here? As we jump to our text, read from verse 18. So it's Luke chapter 7 from verse 18. John's disciples told him about these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? You would never, ever expect a line from anyone, but especially not from John the Baptist. John the Baptist, you were there. You told people that you were unworthy to, to untie his sandals. That's what you told people. With fear and trembling, you baptized Jesus. When you were a baby in your mother's womb and you heard Mary speak, you leapt. You saw the dove descend. You heard the voice, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. John, you've pointed your disciples and your followers to Christ and said, follow him. What is going on? Why this moment of crisis of faith. Well, let's carry on with our text. It said, when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us, uh, sent us to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits. They gave sight to many who were blind. And he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind have received sight, the lame walk, and those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the deaf are raised, raised and uh, uh, sorry, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. After John's messengers had left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? 
a reed swayed by the wind? If not, why did you go, what, what did you go and see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothing indulge in luxury, uh, in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out and see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, more than a prophet. This is the one whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way before you. I tell you, among those born uh, of the woman, there's no one greater than John. Yet the one who is the least in the kingdom is greater than he. All the people, even the tax collectors, when heard Jesus' words, acknowledged God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts of the law rejected God's purpose for they themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Jesus went on to say, To what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? Are they like children sitting in a marketplace calling out to each other? We played a pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a, 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 a dredge, but you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread or drinking wine, yet you say he is a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, yet you say he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proven right by all her children. So we see John's moment of crisis here. Gets to the point in faith where he starts to doubt in this. Well, why do we believe John doubted? I think there are a number of things. Uh, one, maybe it was his disciples that were doubting. And John was sending his disciples to kind of hear for themselves who Christ was. It's a possibility. Another possibility is because where he was. Anyone found yourself going through a rough moment? Circumstances, situations are tough and it's rough. Doesn't doubt sometimes slip in then? When we're crushed, when we're heartbroken, when we're under such incredible pressure, does doubt not slip in at those very points? He was in prison. What's going on, Lord? Where am I at? You know, the prophecy here is saying that you will set the captives free, but I'm still captive. Why haven't you taken care of me, your cousin? Why am I still here for, for what I feel that God called me to do? Why am I stuck in this? God, do you not love me? God, have I messed up? Have you been in that place? Where it's just going so tough, and maybe you're there right now. Man, it it's, can't get harder than this. God, where are you? Have you left me? And that doubt overcomes you. Maybe that's where John was at. John could have also been at a place where he was doubting his purpose. Did he really fulfill his purpose? Was Jesus the one? Did he do the right thing? Did he mess up knowing that his life was basically on, on execution, on death row there? Did he mess up? Did he get it right? Have you been there? Maybe you've been so overcome by sin and you're just at this base where, God, I've so messed up. Do you still love me? God, I can't go on. Can you still use me? God, this can't get any worse. And you've lost that. And I just need to know, are you the right one? John probably at this point has heard about the persecution, the murmurings that are happening. How people are stopping following Jesus and, and what's going on and taking place there. Maybe he's heard some of that. Maybe John was at a place where he kind of, his mindset of who Christ is and should have been doing was kind of blown or warped. You see, John came preaching a message about repent, repentance for judgment is near. Jesus comes and preaches a message about love and mercy and salvation. Where's this king that was going to come kick out the Romans? Some of the Jews were waiting for that. 
Where's this king that was going to come bring the kingdom? Usher the kingdom right here, right now. He'd been speaking about this kingdom. Where was this king? How can you defeat the Romans by speaking about mercy and love? What's going on? Are you the one, Jesus? Are you the one? Sometimes we have a warped idea. Our view on who God is might be warped. And when he doesn't meet that view, we hit a moment of crisis. God, are you really there? The Father Christmas God who just gives out gifts. Lord, why am I not receiving? I've named and claimed that, that BMW and Joshua has not heard me. God, you haven't given this. You haven't provided Is my view of him warped? Maybe you're there. Well, I love this. What is Jesus' response to the messengers and later to John? Is it one of rebuke? It's not only saying, why did you doubt? Where are you at? Why are you doing this? You're my cousin. You should know who I am. You've heard from the Lord. You've prepared the way. What are you doing, John? Jesus doesn't do that. He shows the miracles that's happened. Miracles that usher love and care and incredible power of God's hand. And his disciples, John's disciples, witness this that's taking place. And Jesus kind of shows them this. And with that, he says, you know, and he starts to quote scripture. He fulfills, he starts to show the fulfillment in many of the Isaiah prophecies here. Isaiah 47, Isaiah 32, so many of them. And we start to see how the Messiah would come. And the Messiah would be a person that would be doing the miracles, not just talking about it. And here Jesus shows them those miracles and he shows them the full moon and he shows them the text. And as they go off, he affirms John's ministry. And I want to give you absolute comfort. You know what? We all have moments of doubt. And when we go through moments of doubt, we think, God, have I kind of abandoned you? Have I thought of you less in this? Well, I want you to know you're going to go through those moments. What is God's response to us? He reveals who he is. He shows his love and he affirms. How incredible is he? So what do we do when we have times of doubt? I'm going to jump into this. Firstly, we need to ask Jesus. I love the fact that John was dealing with doubt and not unbelief. He was seeking answers. He didn't have a hardened heart to say, God, I don't want to know you. Because that's a decision. But he's saying, God, I'm not sure. I'm skeptical right now. Now, many people call themselves skeptics, but skeptics actually search the truth, search for answers. That's what skeptics do. I've been a skeptic. I've been a skeptic in sometimes what people say. And I say, I want to just check this for myself, particularly salespeople. I want to make sure it really is like that. Yeah. I want to make sure a BMW can really beat an Audi. That's why you need to let me have a test drive, Josh. So we get to a place of, of sometimes doubt. But John seeks the truth and he comes to Christ. We need to turn to Christ. Don't in your moment to doubt say, oh, I give up. Because that turns to unbelief. Because they're saying, I reject this. But in moments of doubt, we come and find the truth. Ask God the difficult questions. Ask God those questions you're struggling with. And you can. It's incredible to ask him. Because sometimes God doesn't answer those, but he fulfills us with a peace in who he is. Don't feel like you can't. I, I often used to get quite defensive when, when um, having conversations of faith with unbelievers. 
And sometimes they were, as they would challenge me th- on things, I would feel like I'd have to step up and kind of know my A game. Now, I believe that God calls me to know scripture, but I've learned this, is that I don't need to defend God. Me defending God is like a grade one trying to defend Mike Tyson. Even bigger scenario. I don't have to defend God. He reveals who he is. God is far bigger than your question because he is God. Go and ask him. Go look through the scriptures to see the fulfillment. I've loved those who were atheists that seeked God, who was incredibly skeptical. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite skeptics. Search the truth. And what did they find? They found a living God. Search him. Search the prophecies. Search his word. Spend time in it. He also then tells the disciples to go and tell them, go tell John all that you have seen and heard. Go testify to what God is doing. Church, we need to continuously be sharing testimonies of what God has been doing. We fail to do that because God is at work. I want to tell you through this incredible, incredibly difficult season, I have seen God's hand in so many different ways. I really have seen his hand. Why are we not sharing that? Share those testimonies. I want to encourage you to also journal. When we journal, we can reflect back on God's faithfulness. So when I doubt, I go back to the journey and say, I remember the time God did this. Remember the time I struggled with this. God answered that. What has God answered in your life? What things have you struggled with? Do you remember how faithful he is? Well, that's who he is. Ask Jesus. Secondly, it's about how Jesus sees you. When we doubt, it's about how Jesus sees you. I love how Jesus goes and affirms John's ministry. He affirms this, saying that he wasn't just a prophet, but he was a prophet who was prophesied about. He was the last of the prophets. He ushered in the kingdom. He was the one that was involved in bringing the kingdom in. This is who John is, and he's been faithful. Why did you go to the wilderness? To see a bent reed, somebody that just keeps on swaying towards what people want? Did you go to the wilderness to hear somebody that would just give you sweet talk? No. Did you go to someone that, that would have spend time with, with all the famous and the popular just because you wanted to be there? No. You wanted to go and meet someone who spoke the truth, a prophet. And John was And that's what he does. He starts to affirm who John is. But when we doubt, we go into these mindsets, and Satan sometimes plays with this. Satan slips in doubt often. See this in Genesis, his game. Did God really say? See that sowing of doubt that he said that's in the Garden of Eden? Did God really say? And when we get to moments of doubt, are you really saved? Are you really loved by God? Can God really love you when you do this? What if I went and told everyone you things you did? Would God still love you? Would God still use you? And we start to get to this place where we start to push against God and without doubt we say, God, I've got to fix this first before I can come back to you. God, I've got to work on this first. I can't, you can't love me. And we start to look at how we see ourselves or how we think others will see us. I can't tell anyone else about my doubt because I'm supposed to be that Christian pastor that loves Nando's. Got to put it in there. They're starting to sponsor me again. So we start to do that. And so we start to kind of fake it. But it's about how Jesus sees you. I did this exercise with the grade fours 
in, uh, at Hatfield, um, grade fours and fives at Hatfield Christian School. And uh, they were stuck with me for a few days. And I asked them, if God had a pass mark, what would that pass mark be? And they kind of debated around what that would be. I find it very scary that doctors only have to have a 50% pass mark. So you go to doctors and hope that they know the 50% that you're struggling with. But if God had to have a pass mark, what would it be? And if you had to give Mother Teresa a pass mark, what, what pass mark, I mean, what mark would you give her in terms of goodness? And it was interesting hearing some of the scores that would come out. 70, 80, you know, 90 percent. Some of them were going 100, and I said, you know, she had a sandal. There were a whole bunch of kids around. I'm sure she hoid it. <laughs> yeah. Then I asked, you know, if you had to give Hitler a mark, what would you give him? Well, he must have had some good. Because no one went, oh, he's pure evil. Let's elect him. Some of the things he spoke about, obviously, was truth. Turn to pure evil. What mark would you give him? And what mark would you give yourself if you had to look at the scale of righteousness? What would your mark be? Well, how does Christ see you? Well, when you come to know him as your Lord and Savior, when you say, Jesus, I commit my life to you. I put all my faith, my trust in you. I believe in you. I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe that you took all the things I've done, do. Hopefully you're not doing anything right now. Do and will do. You take that on the cross for me. So that when God sees me, he sees me at what? A hundred percent. He sees his son. How incredible is our Lord. You may be in an area of doubt. You may be struggling with sin. You may feel so distant from God. But how does God see you? At 100% through his son. You have become a child of the most high God. You've experienced a love, so are you loved, that God is never abandoning you. So loved. And we can mess up. And we can sometimes jeopardize our ministry, and I've seen that. But when we turn to him, we experience God's grace and mercy. Yes, we may be faced with consequences. But God's grace and mercy... And he affirms and he picks us up for his kingdom and his glory. You have that doubt. It's not about how others see you. It's not about how you see yourself. But it is about how Christ sees you. And he sees you as his child. Amen. Thirdly, we need to remove Jesus from a box. We need to stop boxing Christ in. Turns around and says, Blessed in anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now, Christ, you're pure, you're holy, you're, you're teaching truth. How can we stumble? Well, the, the kind of context, uh, the context around this is those who kind of perceive false. Lord, I'm looking to you for this. I want you to be. The rescuer, get us out from the Romans. I'm not worried about this bigger kingdom you're talking about. I'm talking about now. Kind of mindset. God, I'm coming to you because I want to experience just the miracles. God, I'm coming to you this. And sometimes we run to Christ for the wrong things. We box him in. God can only do this. God, you can only have this part of my life. When we do that, we will miss the big picture. Goes on, verse 33. For John the Baptist came neither drinking, uh, neither eating bread nor drinking wine, yet you say he was a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, yet you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. 
What did this mean? They didn't really want to hear the truth. They weren't looking for the Messiah that God was sending. They were sending, looking for the Messiah that would just suit them. Are we looking for a Christ that would just suit us? Or are we seeking after the living God and who he is? God, I'm going to trust you even when it seems strange. God, I'm going to trust you even though it faces persecution. God, I'm going to trust you even though it's unpopular. God, I'm going to trust you with everything and do that because I know you know what's best. Point blank. Stop boxing God in. So we serve a living God who loves you. And you know what? Hasn't been caught surprised by some of our doubts. Who knows the struggles we go through. Who knows us that have brought us to this place of desperation. He knows all of that. And he so loves you. Are you willing to turn back to him? Say, God, I don't understand. But I know I just need you. God, I need you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we can't box you in. We can never fully define you because you are far greater. You're the Alpha and the Omega. There's no one ho more holy than you. No one greater than you. You are the King of Kings. Yet you chose to send your son for us. You chose to die for us. And we just want to praise you. And Lord, we want to seek you. Even when sometimes we feel like you're not there. We need to seek you, Lord, even when we feel like we're not worthy. We need to seek you, Lord, when it seems like the world is collapsing around us because we know we need you and I pray I pray for each person that is going through that time that they would experience your peace would have such a new renewed love for your word that we could continue as a church leaping to testify of your greatness so we pray this in your name Amen